have to repeat it again, Victor. <laughs> yeah, welcome, welcome to the uh, risk working group for the Chaos Project here on the lovely June twenty second, twenty twenty three. Um, we'll get started with the agenda. I'll put it in the notes again. Oops, that's the wrong clipboard item. Put it in the chat rather. One more time. And I suppose I can share. Thinking this is the right one. Can make that smaller. So it doesn't need to take up as much space on your screens. Yeah, so um, you were saying, Sophia, I'm sorry, I got lost in the setting up of the recording. You're muted now. If I remember correctly, Victor was talking about sort of the company management and ownership aspect and how we would want to incorporate that and potentially the transparency. But Victor, if you could say that again, just so we can officially record that comment and suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, mainly so one company decided to take their open source project in a, a closed source. So that's, uh, I was originally thinking that's a, like a corporate citizen topic. And later on, yeah, it's probably a, it's actually part of risk management as well, at least. Well, I know we've had, certainly there have been parts of the Chaos Project that relied on Elasticsearch that experienced some difficulty when they closed that. Um, and open source, open search, of course, has worked to take its place, but that was not a smooth transition for people who had committed to Elasticsearch. And I, I think there's been a discussion um, in in the course of this group over the years about how how those choices usually emerge from a single firm or a set of interests having control of a governing board for a project. Sophia, correct me if I'm remembering a completely different conversation. Um, no, I think that was definitely part of it. Um, and actually a an related and unrelated conversation I have with a researcher who's been thinking about risk and open source. Uh, we will kind of, I didn't really know how to categorize the risk of sort of the conflation between a company and a project and in terms of just like how you think about this evolution, Elastic was one example of a project and a company with the same name and the same project name. Um, and then when there was an issue with the project in the project community, now there has been a schism um, and have multiple projects that are both closed and open source available in the market. Um, and that did, I don't know how much that's impacted their brand and their company, but I have to imagine it did something um, just in terms of their reputation in the community. Um, and just sort of thinking about that, there's, there's two elements of risk. There's the risk to the consumers or dependents of the project when the license model change and the governance model changes. Um, but there's also the risk to the, the one, the company that created it and the risk of changing their model and the perception and reputation and usage risk that, that comes along with it. So I think, um, Victor, you, you might already hear how we're talking about this. I think something that we struggle with in this working group is every, everything can kind of be a risk sometimes, uh, determining on how, and so trying to get a little bit clearer on risk to whom and in what scenario um, to try to at least within our, in our own definitions and a selection of metrics, we have some orientation there because it could suddenly become a boil the ocean adventure. This, um, uh, yeah, actually risk of that's a good question. I was thinking <laughs> is wh whoever is the, uh, I guess this, the, um, I'm actually, I'm not sure is, is this, this working group is a part of the, the OSPO as well or is it separate? <laughs> We're separate, um, but I think many of us also sit in the OSPO working group. So there's some overlap with the interest in OSPO to be more aligned to metrics that are in support of OSPO specifically where risk is more general. Uh, and I see Gary, Gary has their hand up, but I want you to finish your thought, Victor. 
whoever is the I guess the, where's the whoever is the OSPO group is I think is that's that's what's what's risk for and also um, I was always curious now we have so much matrix then in theory we can also calculate risk score right so and how to how to do that. <laughs> Um, I actually want to answer, put Gary answer because I think Gary has also been working on this problem from the perspective of an OSPO and trying to create a risk score and framework. Um, so I don't know if that's what you wanted to talk about, Gary, but I'll let you answer your question and then I might put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I, I wanted to contribute to um, how transparent is the project. And I think part of the risk that you're going to feel as either a user or the, the maintainer of a project um, is I think release frequency would be a great metric to watch for the scenario that a lot of uh, companies that I've known um, will develop much of a project internally and then publish like releases or not publish a bunch of commits and do it all at the same time. And so I think that if you see a project that only ever has releases and very few commits, it might be a good indicator that um, the project is being maintained internal to a company. Uh, it's not being open sourced and actually developed in the open. I think there's a lot of other indicators that you might be able to find for that. Like there's not a whole lot of issue activity. There's not a whole lot of PR activity. But I think the one that would be the most obvious is that the, the releases don't coincide with any kind of other activity. I love that. <laughs> and and yeah, if I, I may, I, I, this is Dave Wheeler. Um, I would also want to correlate it with size. You know, having mm -hmm. a, oh, there's a small bug patch and an immediate release is, while it's never ideal, it happens. It's not right, necessarily right. an indicator of a problem. Uh, but um, if you are <clears throat> certain organizations, which I won't name, but should shame, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, it's the, you know, it's the one release congratulations it's the commit if you will of uh you know 100,000 lines of code and there's the release too yeah no that's <laughs> you didn't just do that <laughs> yeah that wasn't sitting on your laptop outside of source control and works perfectly well, the first time right uh it, you know it might have been sitting outside of source control which is itself a risk anyway so <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, mean, I totally agree with, with your concern um you know, I, I, I do accept that the light, you know, to make things simple, if it's under a certain open, under an open source software license, it's open source, but that doesn't mean that they're behaving transparently or, you know, you know applying best practices. So <laughs> it's helpful to identify you are, you are not doing it well. <laughs> Definitely. So that, that would be a new metric for us. I kind of like it. And I think the metric itself is more of that ratio to your point versus we're looking at release frequency as it relates to commits, PRs, issues, maybe coming from the same group of people. But if, if it's, that could be an indication that it's mostly being developed internally and being externalized as a release, but not necessarily collaborated with a, a broader set of people. What? When these releases happen, is it that there are a small number of commits with a large number of lines of code where it, where it's kind of obvious a lot of work has been getting done somewhere else? Um, I would say yes, but it seems like Gary has a thought. Yeah, and I, I, I wonder if the API would surface like something else that I could picture happening is um, they have an internal version, they have an external version, they push the history to the external version all at the same time. And then suddenly there is all of this activity. And now I'm going to cut a release because that would be like the simpler way to be cutting those releases uh, publicly if you were developing it privately. And so I don't know if the API surfaces when like all of that activity is imported, but that would be uh, another way to indicate that provided that they don't just commit it all at the same time. I mean, we certainly, the, the API certainly gives us data and I know Augur and Grimoire Lab both provide data that would let you understand if a large number of lines of code were committed in a small number of commits or in a short period of time, followed by a release, followed by a long period of silence. Right. So that, that phenomena is easily revealed. I think the thing that happens a lot, which is okay, I think, is a lot of companies that contribute to open source and then build value added products on services on top totally. of that 
open source platform, which is not what we're talking about. But I think so there's good that happens by keeping some things out of the open. Yeah, I would actually think that it's a it's an indicator that the project is more likely to uh, stick around if there's a paid product that's supporting the development specifically of a library or function. Yeah, I just clicked on this OSSF scorecard link. Yeah, we OSS scorecards, one of the pieces yeah. of software that Augur ingests. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I think uh, quick, yeah, quick, yeah, quick clarification. Ahead. The GitHub username is OSSF. The org is OpenSSF. There we go. I carry on. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Yes, I, I do I do know the org name, but the GitHub name, the GitHub org name did confuse me. Yeah, it's because we somebody squatted it. The lesson learned here is when you decide on a name, don't just check for DNS. Get the GitHub name before you announce it. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's one to learn the hard way. Yeah, we actually, we, I, I haven't really checked on these the squatter, but uh, if they're not doing much, we may just beg. Hey, GitHub, you're a member of our group. <laughs> Can you give us our own name? <laughs> Yeah. But that won't work for everybody. The the lesson learned still applies. <laughs> yeah. I've tried to get a squatter off of a dom of a GitHub org I wanted, and they hadn't done anything in ten years, and GitHub wouldn't do it because they log in. They logged in once in the last year. They didn't do anything, but yeah. they logged in once in the past year. A, a friend of mine mm -hmm. failed to update a uh, domain name uh, or uh, pay for for the fees. For yeah. the main name that of a of a nonprofit a little little group I was involved in, and lost it for ten years. Finally got it back for four hundred bucks. Wow! Wow! So who hiss? Meanwhile, it was squatted on by I don't you know I don't know what maliciousness they were doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question for David is and so on. sorry the the formula used to calculate the score for uh, yes SSF, for scorecard. Uh, is that is that published that the yes. actual formula if you, yeah if you click on it yes all the details of exactly what's measured but it's it's a weighted average um i don't remember what the weights are but it's like there's a low medium high low is one i think medium is three I forgot what high is, maybe five. It's it's all posted there. Um, now, I mean, there's pros and cons to scorecard, but the idea is, um, I mean, like all things, no tool is perfect because we live in an imperfect world. But what it's doing is it's looking for indicators. 10 means, hey, things are looking pretty good. Zero means no. And it has a whole bunch of things like, hey, do you have branch protection on? Uh, which means, and that forces you more or less to post to a separate, you know, here's my proposed change, giving people mm -hmm. time perhaps to review before you bring it into the main branch. Um, uh, you know, it was just, uh, yeah, if you, if you look at what is scorecard, yeah, keep, yeah. keep scrolling down. Okay, there's, okay, public data, the API, keep going. Oh, uh, let's see, I guess it's moved around. Um, there's actually a separate page, which, okay. Yeah. This is all about using it. Let me give you the link. It's, uh, it's on there somewhere, but there's a link to the, um, uh, to the actual, uh, default scorecard checks. It's near the top. And then, then there's the detailed check documentation. There we go. Here, watch out. What? I, I'll just post the link in the chat. Uh, yeah. And these are, these are it's right at the top there. Yeah. You like, scroll past it, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, yeah, oh, but okay. it's, it's a, it's a simple weighted average. And, you know, right. the, obviously the issue is, you know, what there are you scoring? Go. So, you know, hey, does it have tests? Does it have the, well, what, what they call the CII best practices badge, that, that you know, which is now called the Open SSF best practices badge, but, you know, that, that's what they're referring to. Um, let's see here, code review, uh, contributor, you know, how many contributors and, and so on. Um, now there are problems it, with so it, it somewhere we're working on. Yes, go ahead. Is it equally weighted or is there, is there a weight for? Yeah, one? there's a weight. It's a weighted average. Do you see the high, medium, low third column? So high is going to. High, yeah, right, but what, what happens is each of these scores, you know, has a weight, which is verbally rated as high, medium, low. And then the overall uses that verbal 
to basically uh, weight it. I, I, you know, if you're not familiar with weighted averages, I mean, if you just average numbers, you add them up, okay? If you weight it, it, let's say you weight it by three, that means it's as if it was there three times. So you multiply by three on the top, what you're adding, and you count it as three instances on the denominator, okay? Um, it, it's just a way to give so, certain values more weights. It's a pretty common mechanism, uh, simplistic mechanism for scoring. It looks like there's maybe four levels because one is critical. Oh, okay. I forgot about that one. I mean, what I just said is still true. Yeah. I don't remember what the uh, weight numbers are offhand, but it's it's in there somewhere. One, two, three, four makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I mean, yeah, unless it doesn't. So yeah, it may it may be different, of course. Yeah, but 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 that's the but the, the whole point of focusing on the high, medium, low was to, you know, to uh, focus on the is this considered you know, a stronger signal or not. And the idea is to try to give a special weights to signals. Uh, I will note that some of these signals, there's challenges um, and there we're working on them. In particular, currently it only works on GitHub. We're fully aware that there's a large, vast number of projects that aren't on GitHub. Um, we're working actually with Lockheed Martin, um, who is implementing a, uh, the uh, code editions for GitLab. Um, that hasn't been merged yet, but that's, you know, I mean, they've, they've got some, some stuff running. Um, and um, uh, it's always, I, you know, I think people are aware of tools, uh, false positives, false negatives. So for example, tests, if you're using GitHub actions and certain kinds of tests, we detect it. If you're using Circle CI or Travis or Jenkins, we don't detect you. You must not be running any tests. Interesting. Okay. Why? Because it turns out that detecting all possible configurations of software is really hard. <laughs> and so we've got people working on this and, you know, in improving and we'll just, I'm sure we'll get, you know, if this, we will continue on that as long as this project lives. Well, we may be all be dead before we're done. But the, uh, the idea is basically um, no tool is perfect but this gives us much more information than we had otherwise and you know a way to give you a quick score of an arbitrary project is really helpful yeah i, I will help a little bit and I, my apologies i you know i you know it's been a while since i've looked at the mechanism but uh at the you know how they the scores get combined but i'm pretty sure what i just described to you is right i guess gotta i, I, I gotta find it. it's documented here somewhere i just gotta find it <laughs> no, i think it I, I think it helps i think i think it's also you know i've been using i've been applying scorecard with auger for uh, and here years. it is i found it okay okay uh critical is 10 high is 7.5 medium is five low is two and a half okay Okay, so, uh, you know, I was correct in the process. I just didn't remember the weight numbers. And of course, that's because most of the times you never see those weight numbers. Uh, you only see those verbal descriptions. Yeah, and what I will say is that OpenSSF is actively, and the scorecard team is actively adding things right. to this list. It's um, in the last 18 months that I've been using it, it's changed, you know, what's in there has grown. Um, yeah, and, and, and we, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, the growth is slowing. At first, it was very high, um, but it's still, it's still, they're still adding metrics to it. Yeah, and uh, we've actually got somebody who's trying to work off all the issues, and um, we're we're working to uh, improve our uh, internal test coverage to at least eighty percent statement coverage. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, it already has some tests, but it's not, you know. <laughs> Like any, no software, as far as I can tell, is done. I'm sure there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, software is never done. So we know there's functionality that it's missing that we'd like it to have. We know that it's got tests, but not not coverage enough. We're improving that, you know, working on GitLab, working on detecting more things. Um, so, you know, uh, I th we think it's helpful. We know there's more work that needs to be done. Like, I think it's really helpful. We're oh, and one thing you didn't mention, we are running weekly scans once a week of over a million open source projects and storing the results. <laughs> so you can actually query an API and get the results that we have. That's very cool. 
So uh, while if you if you link to the repo, it really emphasizes how to download the tool as well as how to get it from the API. You know, getting it from the API is easy. <laughs> yeah, I did see. I hadn't ever known there was an API. I just keep running it on my server, but with uh, our, our 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 servers, thank you. <laughs> No, I actually download the project and run it on my server. Yeah, no, that no, that, that that's that's my thing. You know, the reason we only do it weekly across a million is because that's a million. Uh, whereas if you run it locally, you can do things like every commit or every whatever, you know, whenever you want to. Yeah, I'm I'm scrolling just to see if I can find the API endpoint. But... Um, yeah, you look up API. You'll you you you. Know, yeah, it's, it's all there. Critical. It's the, 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 we could probably reorganize it and make it a little clearer, but the information's there. You just got to hunt for it a little bit. Yeah, it's the classic open source readme. I have to control F to find what I'm looking for. Uh, it's not just limited open source, let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> All right. So uh, I hope that wasn't too much of a sidebar, but. Uh, I right. Well, I think it's you know, an important sidebar, especially for newer folks to meetings. I think this is something that in general, we've, we've brought up a lot in this risk working group is that if, I want to say last year or so we definitively acknowledged that our group wasn't going to focus too much on the security measurements and components because there was so much work happening in the open SSF um, that we thought it would be more valuable to focus on non security centric risk acknowledging that there's existing tooling and metrics suggested by the open SSF that we would point to. But I think not everyone who comes to our group or to our metrics knows that history. And so I think for something like a metrics model, while we have sort of the three areas that we discussed that we can get back to in a bit, but it might also be helpful to have sort of the reference for other areas of risk, like to essentially acknowledge that scorecard could be part of your assessment as well if you as, a, as an easy way to sort of incorporate a security scan um but knowing that our our metrics model wasn't really security centric um because of that sort of our our purpose built design to ensure that we were adding to the conversation versus doing something that the open ssf was already working on and didn't want to be redundant Right. And, and now, to be fair, the open SSF is happy to steal. I mean, use the chaos work. <laughs> um, so uh, with, with credit. Um, so, uh, you know, and indeed, uh, within the open SSF, I mean, scorecard is an effort to just kind of immediately do a quick look, mostly at process things like, you know, do you have branch protection? You know, do you have a badge? Is there a test, you know, testing? Is there you know, static analysis is their dynamic analysis. Um, but, uh, you know, there's other efforts to try to gather more information like the OpenSSF dashboard, which is going to try to gather other secure, again, still security focused, security focused um, information, um, including scorecards and other kinds of information that are organized quite differently. So uh, stay tuned. So I have two questions. One is when we talk about this um, metrics development for metrics model, like are these the metrics for our first metrics model? One question that arises to me from this discussion is, is open SSF scorecard kind of an easy one in a way to be an opening part of a risk I, metrics model? I, I would include it. It's, you know, it's something, you know, ba basically the, uh, the OpenSSF best practices badge and the OpenSSF scorecard are kind of the two main ways that we provide quick evaluation of projects. And they they take two different approaches. And in fact, the scorecard uses best practices badge as one of its inputs. And in fact, yeah. on my to-do list for this year is the best practices badge is going to bring in some of the data from scorecard. So, you know, although they're two different projects, you know, they actually are supposed to, we, what I've said is, hey, they're like peanut butter and jelly. Um, they're both trying to accomplish overall the same objective, but they do it differently and can work well together. Well, um, no, scorecard say, yeah. is totally automated. Badge <laughs> is human. Yeah. Automation. And I, I think, you know, the uptake for the open SSF scorecard is greater and it, it includes the CII 
or the open SSF best a, as a metric. That's right. That's right. So, Although there's no, there's no shame in pulling that out separately. Um, so, but absolutely. Yes. Please do include the open SSF scorecard. That's pretty straightforward. And you don't have to recopy all of it. Just say, Hey, there's this scorecard go here. If you want to learn more about how to use a tool to automatically measure it. And, and really, I think that's, uh, for the whole point of scorecard is automated measurement. So you really sooner or later want to point to the tool anyway. Uh, you don't want to try to redefine it by hand all over again. That's, you know, that's, you know, they both, they implement and document what they've, what they've implemented. And so that so leads, much. that leads to my next question, which is, it looks like under the metrics model top heading there, We've discussed all of the things except how does it relate to the broader ecosystem? We've discussed them. I think I have still more thoughts on what we've discussed. Okay, keep <laughs> I mean, going. I was just kind of, yeah, I was just kind of coming I... back to the transparency one because I think the sort of company control is one part of it. Um, but I think early in earlier iterations, we had sort of discussed maybe like a, a documentation checklist. <laughs> do you have a public governance document? Um, do you like, are you, is your SBOM available? Basically like there's a Fire documentation Asia. checklist. Um, and yeah. then the sort of company, like if you have a large elephant factor, then we would suggest this other sort of, I like this, this combination of sort of like, not only looking at company participation as, as an evaluation of company ownership, but also the sort of release to commit size or volume or ratio um, as a way to kind of investigate that further or look for indicators versus just participation. I think it's a little bit more nuanced, um, but I would suggest both for something like transparency. I know I, we're trying to pick one, one metric, but I think we're already kind of tacking on a few. It's sort of like if the project looks like this, then you might want to add these other criteria. Um, but we haven't gotten to broader ecosystem because I think that's the hardest. <laughs> well, in the, yeah. And was there, I feel like you had a second question F under the documentation checklist, other than does it have documentation? Like <laughs> does it have it? Uh, specifically governance um, was listed. I was looking at older ones. Uh, we had SBOM just begin transparency of what's in it. Um, and they had best practices badge here, but I think it fits better under the reported vulnerabilities and sort of like the security angle component. So I would I would leave it out here. Did I put it in the right place? Yeah. Okay. And I think we have many of these metrics already developed, so where we could borrow from open SSF. So I, I think drafting a metrics model could be not difficult for us in the next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, do we want to discuss transparency anymore? I'm axing. I, I will say that for some of these things, you may not call them security metrics, but they're still indicators. I mean, you know, for example, we uh, the scorecard absolutely considers failure to test as a security metric. Yeah. Because because seriously, if you aren't testing, yeah. the odds of you getting a release out that's correct are not that high. And even more importantly, if you fix a vulnerability. The odds of you screwing up some functionality along the way when you're in a hurry is also disturbingly high. So yeah. you're basically, you are not ready to release if you have no tests. I have been shocked <laughs> during my engagement with open source at how little software engineering process that I learned when I worked outside of open source doesn't exist in open source. And yet we still produce highly reliable software. So it, leads, it leaves me conflicted. I have, after literally many decades of experience and study of this topic, I have opinions on this. Um, this uh, but uh, this sounds like something we would want to grab a uh, 
grab a beverage, beverage and sit down and have a, have yeah. a chat. Uh, but I, I think that the, the quick answer, though, is what people get taught in schools is often, frankly, unrelated to the real world uh, yeah. for unfortunate reasons. And, you know, when, when you have the whisper chambers saying how you write software disconnected from how software is actually developed, you get really, really bad advice. Yeah, uh, and my bias is I spent a lot of years in safety critical systems, so right where things right. are I, rigorous. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, and and for good reasons. Yeah, um, the number of op of software projects, op not open source, okay, proprietary software that don't have tests is a long and sorted one. So yeah, do we, what do you think, Sophia? What do we do next? Um, I think we should talk a bit about the the untalked about one, the relationship to the broader ecosystem, which I think kind of like, uh, I think David, I'm not sure if we were there, but we're trying to relate it back to sort of the criticality score of like within the ecosystem. And I know like the, the census report attempted to do that with packages across multiple okay. popular package systems, but like right. we didn't, we didn't have a way of doing that within chaos. Okay. Um, how does it relate to the, okay. Um, I can answer some of this, and we, and we in the openness stuff, we actually have a criticality working group. Uh, that's where the criticality score project lives. That's where the Harvard report reports into. Um, so they're, they've been trying for a long time to develop, to help identify what's critical. Turns out that's hard. Let me know if you've seen this movie before. Um, uh, so the Harvard study was was great. I mean, it was a serious quantitative result. It is narrowly scoped. It only covers application libraries in certain ecosystems. You know, so NPM, PyPI, you know, those kinds of things. Okay, so if you're an application, if you're in C or C++, you, you know, those are all going to be excluded. Okay. Um, but for that area, they had some really helpful data, did some real analysis, came up with some very interesting identifications. Uh, the criticality score is interesting. That was an early attempt to identify what's critical. What you really want to do is find out where the software is, but in general, you can't do that. Uh, you know, if, if, if there was some global organization that had S-bombs for everybody and knew how often different products were used, this would be easy. Uh, there is no S-bomb in the sky. Um, so what they did, the, what the criticality score does is it measures what it can. Fundamentally, the criticality score makes the assumption that a project that's really, really active must be widely used. Okay. There are yeah, a few other metrics, but that's the, that's primarily what it what the what criticality score measures is how active the development process is. So I don't think it's wrong in the sense that if you've got a very large number of people making a very large number of commits and you know and you measure it different ways, it is likely to be important. Okay. The social navigation. If there's a lot of people contributing, like if the restaurant right. is full, you probably want to eat there. That's um, exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. But it turns out there are exceptions. <laughs> you know, going to the local tourist trap, for example, you might get to a terrible restaurant. Okay? Yeah. And the same thing is true here, where sometimes this measure fails. I will give you two examples. One which isn't obvious and one which is. The not obvious one is there are some projects which are incredibly busy and are not important to anyone else. In particular, there is a, there is software that's used by CERN, uh, the uh, very, very large, you know, uh, you know, lab. In, they collide uh, atoms together and- Yes, yes. Well, not just the, atoms, the electrons and other- That's right. There. Uh, well, <laughs> Discovered is an interesting term, but okay, proven to exist. Proven to exist, yes. Okay. The Higgs boson. Um, proven yes, to, yes. Proven to exist there. Yeah, I, I, I have an engineering degree, which was one semester short of a physics degree. So don't get me started. It's tempting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, that, so CERN does cool stuff, but they have a software project. I think it's uh, like, um, like an internal web management. I forgot what it is. I think it's some kind of CRM. 
they, you know, like everything else they do, there's over a thousand authors, but it's yeah. only used by a very narrow community. So it's really busy, but it's really not that important. In it's a, it's a very world. narrow community of thousands of heavily funded physicists. Right, <laughs> right. And so, the, so now the obvious problem is software can be used by everyone and it's no longer being maintained. And oh my gosh, I'm worried. It will never show up in the credit quality score in any kind of high level because most of the metrics measure busyness. So given so, given that definition of criticality, I, I might suggest there's something it's else. just the criticality score. That the critical projects yeah. working group does not use that definition. It's, it's just, just the criticality score. There's another indication of criticality of some kind where like um, for example, when Renisha was here, one of the things that Dwayne was doing when he was at Indeed was looking through all 11,000 of the repos that they rely on and to try to understand which dependencies were used in the most number of projects. Right, and Harvard would, did that. Be, okay. What, what they did is they started with the SCA vendors. The, the problem with the dependency tree is A can depend on B, depend on C, but depend on D, but no one uses A. So just counting up who uses, uh, who depends on it doesn't help you. So what they did is they went to the SCA vendors of what has been found in real world applications. And then they followed the tree down. And that uh, was, I think, um, the, I mean, that is the best available data for the subset that they could handle. Okay. I, I mean, really, I mean, you can always complain about any research, but that is the best the world has available. Uh, and we funded it, so there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, hmm. and I was I was involved as well, to be fair. But yeah, uh, I should, hopefully don't I should show you too much against the, me. I should show you some of the things I'm doing with dependency networks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot you can do with dependency analysis, uh, and if you like, uh, I can also talk to you about uh, how to optimize some of the chaining because it turns out order of operations is really important for certain graph operations. What a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, not, <laughs> not, a, not a shock there. Not a shock there. So um, yeah, so I've actually got some stuff posted about, you know, I actually did a census one that what Harvard did was census two. I did census one and some work on that was, that basically laid the groundwork for what Harvard eventually did. So I've done a number of specifically yeah. dependency I, analyses, but the problem is you've got to figure out where the tops are. Just saying somebody dip it, uses it does not really tell you. Yeah, I would love to chat with you about that offline because I, okay. Harvard's, I, I think Harvard's doing census three, whether you know it or not. <laughs> well, we are in discussions with them actually. Okay. Uh, uh, the, I'm, I'm fielding a lot of emails, that's all. Yes, yes. No, no, we, we, we've been talking back and forth about uh, about them doing follow on work. So yes. And you know, if they if they've got a separate funding source and are doing follow on work, that's awesome. We're we are delighted to use research we didn't have to pay for. Yeah, they didn't offer me any money, but that's <laughs> oh, well, they didn't offer me any money either. So um, yeah, so so basically, we there has been analysis it's really challenging to do the analysis. There's, so, it is so difficult to get the data that you need to do the real world analysis that can lead you to reasonable conclusions. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm happy to tell you in depth about some of these things. I'm not sure that but that's this. No, I'm going to, I'm going to send you an email because I, I think um, there's a couple of problems I've encountered with dependencies. The, the biggest one is, oftentimes multiple libraries re resolve to the same github repository mm -hmm. and assessing the maintenance of a library in relation to whether or not it's been whether what so there could be a recent release that didn't change much because they just released all the libraries for all the platforms at the same time sure <clears throat> Anyhow, oh I'll yeah, if you yeah, if you want to talk shop about that, happy to. If you okay. if you want to if you want to claim that hey, there are problems, uh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. All yeah. analysis is hard. And, and other obvious uh, observations. Yes. Um, yeah, I also there's just one one sort of main one, which is if the goal mm -hmm. of this is design a metrics model for someone to put into practice. If we're proposing things, they also have to be feasible for say a company or an individual to run <laughs> and something right. like looking at a, 
a multi-project ecosystem dependency tree and overlap and system level analysis is probably a bit out of scope yeah. for someone who's doing this project. So I'm also thinking what elements can we learn from these efforts to simplify an approach, or maybe we just point to something else like, like this piece of research from Harvard and, and the Linux Foundation that was looking at trying to look at a whole ecosystem level of popularity and criticality versus there's also the contextual piece of criticality in your own system, which we, we can't see, but also that might be more relevant for them. But I think right. if anything, and, yeah. Right. Sorry. And, and criticality doesn't necessarily mean it's a risk. You know, it, you yes. know everybody yeah. may be using something, um, but that doesn't mean that your use of that is a necessarily a bad thing. In fact, there are some who've argued that sometimes depending on something everyone depends on is good because everybody that means that lots of people are probably looking and that there's a problem it'll get immediately fixed because there's some big roller you know big stakes high rollers who depend on it too and will throw whatever money is necessary to fix any serious problem uh at least that's that's a pitch um yeah and happy to talk about that sophie i know we've talked about this before but i guess i i can't help but mention again every time you talk about something like this is the you know immediately the first question is who is this for what question are they trying to answer so usually for security i'm trying to answer questions like you know i'm thinking about using this package is this risky or not or i'm already using this package is this risky or not <laughs> and um in some cases like in the open ssf the critical projects working group is trying to answer of all the projects that exist out there which ones are the most widely used and therefore should receive extra resources but you you basically have to figure out what the question is and then you use the metrics that best match to help you answer that question well given what time it is i would say that maybe that's something we think about and we bring to the next meeting to see how to move it forward because i i agree i think this is a really big question <laughs> um potentially if we're thinking about designing this from the perspective of an individual trying to assess usage of a thing um, then we would have to potentially temper that into what's feasible and what's actually answering their question. When is the next meeting? July 6th, I think. Are we going to keep that one just for holiday reasons? Oh, I, yeah, I mean, I guess we could, uh, we could skip a meeting. I think, I think I should be working that day. I just, I know a lot of people are taking vacation that week, so. I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not, but. What, what, what day are we talking about? The July 6th. Yeah. I, I am supposed to be taking off that day, so. Good for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I'm totally You, you didn't listen to my carefully worded phrase. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be taking off tomorrow, too, and I'm also not. So it does happen to all of us. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'm, right. I'm ostensibly uh, writing retreat right now, but you can see how, how there are certain meetings I still show up at. Mm -hmm. I got some papers to do. Um, I'm just confirming my logic. Yeah, it would be July 6th. So the next meeting after that would be July. Do we want to meet July 6th, Sophia, or should we just go to yeah, July? Let's you know? keep it. All right. And I may not be here. Yeah, and I'll have to admit right now I am kind of overwhelmed. So I may not be able to come to as many of these meetings as I'd like, but I'm always delighted to answer questions if you've got some specifics. But really, right now, I just dumped on you the criticality score, the open SSF scorecard, best practices badge you're already aware of. So at least for those kinds of things, you at least have a mind dump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and I think I think that's helpful to know because I think for something as complex as risk, if we're trying to make a metrics model be simple, then pointing to things that are inherently roll-ups can also kind of help you look at something that is more nuanced without it just being one number. Because I think, like I, I was just thinking about Gary again and your exercise and the number of individual metrics that you brought up. Sorry, I'm just talking about your project now, um, okay. and just like acknowledging that it's risk yeah. is inherently complex and only picking three or four things is probably not enough. No. Um, so some of these roll up metrics, if we can take advantage of them, then we are creating a simpler approach for people where they're only running a couple of things and some of these things are already roll up. So they're inherently taking into consideration more factors than you could on your own I or in a more like simplified approach. 
Yeah, I agree that I think the size of, of the problem for understanding risk and software and the software supply chain is, is very similar to how they tried to understand risk with the moon landing. <clears throat> like, mm. I think there are so many different systems and moving parts that no, no one's going to get it in their single head. <clears throat> All right. Sounds like a good opportunity for the, that beverage. <laughs> yeah. All right. well, 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 at, at some future at some future open source gathering, we should all of us here in this call should go find a place with uh, horizontal surfaces and beverages and uh, talk about all this. That's not sounds, quite sounds in scope, but probably would be fun to talk about. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Good to Thanks see you all. And have a good holiday. Yeah, you Bye. too. You too.